Let's test your audio by naming five restaurants or places in general that you've experienced exceptional hospitality. Canless Restaurant in Seattle, Casa Maria Luigia in Modena, Tayavant in Paris, my cousin's house on Christmas Eve every year, and a flight I was recently on with Delta. All right, you sound good. Let's rock. <laughs> Hey everyone, I'm Cappy and you're listening to Beyond the Plate. I'm a chef by trade and hospitality professional. By day, I head up Rachel Ray's culinary operations and co-founded her cooking and kids charity called Yummo. Five years ago, I had the idea to put together a podcast where we sit down with the world's culinary elite to explore their journey into the food industry and the social impact they have made in their community. Hence, the name Beyond the Plate. If you're new to the pod, welcome. If you listened before, we're so glad you're back. We hope this episode inspires you to cook or, like the chefs we feature, make a difference in your community. And we're grateful to our partners who make this podcast a reality. With that... This episode is brought to you by our friends at One Hope Wine. One Hope is a Napa Valley winery built on hope and rooted in purpose. Every bottle of their award-winning wine supports a meaningful cause. One Hope's commitment to high-quality wine is as important as their commitment to the causes they support. And through the sale of every bottle, One Hope has donated over $8 million to causes around the world. I'm a big fan of One Hope and love how front and center on their homepage, it says, every purchase now gives 10% back to the cause of your choice. So I love it. Putting it back in your hands, you know, what could be better? A bottle of wine and a donation. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about, dude. By the way, speaking of that, I went on their website and I was plugging in random charities that I'm partial to and you could find your favorites on there. There's Boys and Girls Clubs of America, Food Corps, No Kid Hungry, all the biggies. Most of them are on there. Plus, the wines go with like almost anything. I mean, last season's Beyond the Drink. We were pairing wine with popcorn to chips to crazy spices. So really no excuse not to try their wine. For sure, for sure. One Hope also believes that you shouldn't have to sacrifice your wallet to enjoy quality award-winning wines. Their popular Vintner collection begins at $25, which is super affordable and gets delivered right to your door. To learn more about One Hope Wine, the winery, and to apply to become a winery member, go to onehopewine.com. Follow them on Instagram at One Hope and on Facebook at One Hope Wine. One Hope, we thank you. One more thing, we have some awesome Beyond the Plate merch. You can find a link in your podcast player or go to our website, beyondtheplatepodcast.com. Head on over and check out our hats, tees, hoodies, and more. Again, that's beyondtheplatepodcast.com. Enjoy this week's episode. Today's guest is a restaurateur, author, TV personality, and dad. He's the former owner of Make It Nice, the hospitality group that has included the acclaimed 11 Madison Park, Nomad in New York, London, Los Angeles, and Las Vegas, Davies and Brook at Claridge's Hotel in London, and counter service restaurant Made Nice. Through his focus on service and hospitality, he led 11 Madison Park to its pinnacle, earning numerous industry accolades, including the top spot on the world's 50 best restaurants list, Michelin stars, and various James Beard awards. He's a co-founder of the Welcome Conference and the Independent Restaurant Coalition. His first book, Unreasonable Hospitality, The Remarkable Power of Giving People More Than They Expect, has hit bookshelves nationwide. And his first television show, The Big Brunch, will debut on HBO Max with co-judges Dan Levy and and Sola L. Whaley. Please enjoy this episode as we go beyond the plate with Will Gadara. Will, a wise man once said, the best interview technique is no technique at all. <laughs> Do you know who said that? I have an idea. Yeah, no, it sounds very familiar. <laughs> yeah, all right, let me know what you think of my technique at the end. Hot off the press is this AM we're recording. You told Wall Street Journal, were it not for COVID, I would have restaurants in New York already. So right off the top, I'm going to ask, do you miss the day-to-day rush of a dining room? Well, yeah, for sure. A hundred percent. And there's no world in which that won't be a part of my life again. At the same time, of all the devastating things that COVID brought to my family, different people that I know and love, the world at large, I think we can all look at it and find its silver linings and all the things we learned during it and our 
fighting to hold on to now that the world is opening back up again. I think most people can point to a couple things that they're grateful to COVID for. And for me, perhaps top on that list was effectively getting, forcing me to not end up with a restaurant already. When I sold my company, you know, when you do something for a very long time, when you are celebrated for your work doing it, it becomes a pretty big part of your identity. And in fact, you can convince yourself it is your entire identity. And so when I sold my restaurants, I don't know that I actually understood where my restaurants ended and where I, as a person outside of them, began. And so the moment that happened, I started running to reopen restaurants. And when COVID started, I was one week away, and there's no hyperbole here, from signing three restaurant leases in New York City. And so do I miss the dining room and working in restaurants, perhaps more importantly, leading a team of people that are caring for other people 100%? Yet, am I grateful that I was forced to not just go right back to doing the thing that I'd been doing for the past 15 to 25 years, depending on how you count it, and instead be in a position where I had the space and the grace to decide that I want to do that, not because it's what I've always done, but because it's the thing that I want to do next. I love it. But it's probably, it's given you a, I don't want to say a break because you keep busy, but allowed you to have quality time with your daughter, Frankie, who's now 18 months. We talked a little bit about before we hit record, right? How's she doing? She's great. Sleeping? We were saying, eating? I've been very lucky on the sleep, very lucky on the sleeping side. She's always slept well. She's an eater for sure. To that point, I can't imagine what the last 18 months would have been like were I living the life that I've always lived. I still work quite a bit, but having the ability to be more present with her in these early months is something I'll be forever grateful for. And hospitality is a craft. It's a muscle that you strengthen with persistence and time and intention. So is being a dad, right? And like, I'm learning an entirely new discipline in being a dad to her. And yes, I miss restaurants. I also feel very lucky that I've gotten to have this time when I had it. Totally. And time with your wife, of course, Christina, who's the founder of Milk Bar, but on her Instagram describes herself as, this is funny, comfortably human. Yes. (laughs) I love it. What makes her comfortably human? And the other thing she'll say is perfectly imperfect. My wife and I are very compatible, perhaps because of our differences. I think we both have, as far as like core values and like non-negotiables and the underlying principles of who we want to be as people in the world, loving and supporting and pursuing other people. I think we're pretty aligned. But in the book, I talk about my OCD tendencies and how whenever she parks the car, I repark it. Or whenever she makes the bed, I remake it. Or literally whenever she puts a book on her side table, I go over and realign it so it's even with the edges of the table. We definitely find the word perfect differently. And I say that in the most adoring of ways, because I actually think that she has made me a better person in recognizing all the beauty that lies in imperfection. Not that she's not a perfectionist with her craft and with her baking and all of that, but just the way that she sees the world, she celebrates a lot of the things that I would be predisposed to want to try to fix. Okay, let's go back in time and find out more about young Will Gadara. So take us back to Sleepy Hollow, New York in the 80s. What was Will like? (laughs) Sleepy Hollow, New York in the 80s. Let's see, I loved my 8-bit Nintendo, which I still have today. In fact, one of my buddy's kids were with us the other day and we were playing Super Mario Brothers and Mike Tyson's Punch-Out on the old school console. My best friends then are two of my best friends now. I feel blessed in that the people that I was just surrounded by then, we've pursued one another kind of throughout our entire lives since. And that's such a wonderful thing. And I talk so much about pursuing relationships as it pertains to managing people or serving people. But it's, I think, perhaps most important relative to the community you surround yourself with. And I don't think there's, there there are a few things more beautiful than relationships that span decades because you get to see one another change and grow. They hold you accountable and they make sure you never believe too much about what other people say about you. Same friends, Nintendo. I played soccer. I played tennis. I had a cat named Wilbur. My dad was in the restaurant business. He worked all the time, but 
Man, he was my hero. I loved going to work with him. I loved working in the restaurants with him. I played the drums in a grunge band and then a ska band and then a funk band. Yeah, life was good. How about the Gadara family dinner table? What did that look like? You know, our dinner table was different than most. My mom, when I was about four years old, was diagnosed with brain cancer. They removed the tumor from her brain and she survived. But because of radiation treatment, it was only so long before she became a quadriplegic. And my dad with his restaurant hours and my mother with her condition, we didn't have the seven o'clock, mom just cooked dinner, we all sit down around the table. It was very different than that. Although it is the only thing I knew and I believe in many ways it was just as special as what other people experienced. I got to watch with awe as my dad worked restaurant hours and yet was consistently serving her and me. I got to learn much earlier than most how good it feels to serve, which some people say, man, I'm so sorry you had to do that. But I actually look at it as a blessing because I had to take care of my mother from a very early age. And yeah, do I wish my mom hadn't gotten brain cancer or become a quadriplegic? Do I wish she was still alive today? A hundred percent. Do I believe that my dad and I are closer? Do I believe I'm a better person for it? Also a hundred percent. So dinner, dinner growing up, Kraft macaroni and cheese was a go-to because a lot of the time I was at home alone cooking for myself. Hamburger helper. I made a bunch of hamburger helper when I was a kid. Good old eighties foods. Yeah. But I would cook and I'd feed my mom and we'd hang out and eat dinner together. And then we'd watch. We loved Price is Right. That was one of our things growing up. So your mom, she was a flight attendant. You were saying your dad worked in the industry. Is there a moment you remember when service or hospitality had an impact on you? There's a couple. I mean, the one I, the one I talk about in the book is the first meal I ever had at the Four Seasons, where I went with my dad when I was 12 years old. And the Four Seasons, my dad was the president of Restaurant Associates, which you know, was the company that actually opened the Four Seasons, although by the time I was that age, they had sold the Four Seasons to the two guys that ran it. But my dad and Restaurant Associates still ran Brasserie, which was right downstairs from the Four Seasons. Brasserie is now the Lobster Club. Four Seasons is now the pool and the grill. And so I had worked at Brasserie for years, like not worked, but my dad would drop me off there and I'd help in the kitchen or whatever. And the first time I went to the Four Seasons was one of the most amazing nights of my life. We're all pretty familiar with the quote that I've come to learn is misattributed to Maya Angelou. People will forget what you say, they'll forget what you do, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. That, in a nutshell, was that night. Because I don't remember much about it. I remember the Brooks Brothers blazer my dad got me for the occasion. I remember dropping my napkin. It's so funny when you like the things you remember from earlier in life. I remember dropping my napkin and someone giving me a new one and calling me sir. And I think it was the first time anyone had called me sir. But mostly I just remember sitting there with my dad by the pool, feeling so lucky to be having dinner with him and just him. And the idea that for a few hours, everything in the world ceased to exist, except for the two of us at that table in that room. And I was hooked. What was your first job? My first job, like first job where I got a paycheck was at Baskin Robbins. I was just the guy that ran the counter at the Baskin Robbins in Terrytown, New York. Did you learn anything at that Baskin Robbins that you went on to use later in your career or still use? It could be how to scoop the perfect cone. Well, no, the job I had after that was at Ruth's Chris Steakhouse, which was just a year later, where I was a busboy and a host. The lesson that I learned there, which, yes, I I definitely have applied it to every restaurant I've had since, was, okay, Ruth's Chris is a chain restaurant, right? That was a franchise. It was owned by a guy who paid some franchise fee. And because it was a franchise, there's corporate standards, right? It looks a certain way. The service happens a certain way. And well, for sure, the menu is the menu. But I don't know who the owner was. I don't even remember the general manager. But Whoever the owner was must have had a connection to this specific fried calamari dish. Fried calamari were cut into strips instead of rings, and it was served at that restaurant, except it wasn't on the menu. It was just something that they sent out either to regulars or to someone they'd messed up for that they were hoping to right the ship, or maybe it was someone that they were just pursuing. The fried calamari was so good. 
A. I'm not sure what made it so good, but it was so good. But B, what I loved about it is you go to so many restaurants and when they want to make you feel special, they send you an extra dessert or an extra glass of champagne. The problem is you can look at the menu and see exactly what those things cost. And so immediately, this restaurant loves me $14 worth. Because that fried calamari wasn't on the menu, you couldn't order it. It was by definition priceless. And it made me love that gift. I think that gifts are one of the most important things in hospitality. How you give gifts, the gifts that you give, the thoughtfulness that goes into the gifts that you choose to give are like this beautiful way to kind of distill everything that hospitality is into a single concept. And I've taken the inspiration of that fried calamari with me to every restaurant I've had. That's cool. Did you always know you were going to study and eventually go into hospitality? I did, actually. Well, no, I joke because my dad was like, my, he still is very intentional, very deliberate, very disciplined. And when I was 12, he asked me to write down my to-do list for life, my life to-do list. And on it was to go to Cornell, to the School of Hospitality, to open up a restaurant in New York City and to marry Cindy Crawford. I got two out of the three. Yeah, and I was going to say, yeah. The third, I did pretty damn well. So I'm doing <laughs> yeah. pretty good. How did you know about Cornell as a 12-year-old? Because my dad was in the restaurant business. And got so I, okay. I must have said, at that point, I knew I wanted to be in the restaurant business, perhaps mostly because I just wanted to be like my dad. I was... He was my hero. I mean, Cornell is a, I say because as an FIU graduate, I know Cornell has a, <laughs> Cornell is a strong hospitality school as well. We don't have to get into that, Will. As well. <laughs> but, <laughs> so that's why you went to Cornell, obviously, for the hospitality program. Yes. Yeah, exactly. I was curious when I was thinking about it, it's, you know, I talk with chefs on here and ask them about culinary school it comes up. And some are all for it and some, as you probably know, are not all for it. You know, get the experience in a kitchen, et cetera. What are your thoughts on it, I guess, from that like point of view? I loved all my education. I did culinary and hospitality and I think it was great. And I get where people come from and say, just get the experience. You need to go to school. I mean, listen, I, like going to Cornell to the hotel school is a different kind of experience, right? It's almost like it's going to a normal university where you have a major. I got to take everything from Mahayana Buddhism to photography and oceanography and classes at the business school and everything in between. I think that I became a lot of who I am in those four years. And I think it's a healthy, I think just learning to learn at that level is an experience that's hard to replace. Because keep in mind that what I do is, it's a craft, the hospitality side is a craft, but you're also in marketing, you're in advertising, you're in design, you're in leadership, you're in accounting, right? And I don't think that one or two or three jobs would have given me an, a solid enough foundation kind of to cover the breadth of what I need to be good at. So after Cornell, did you go to Spain or Europe? Is that what it was? Yeah. Did your dad convince you to go? And are you glad you went? I'm 100% glad I went. No, you know, I had such great friends at Cornell and loved I loved my time there to the point that I didn't want to study abroad. I just didn't want to leave. I was like, I only have four years of this. I don't want to leave it. But I wanted to have an experience living abroad before I got too entrenched in New York restaurants. And I wanted to learn Spanish, honestly. And so my senior year at Cornell, I took two very intensive Spanish classes and then moved to Spain where I worked at a culinary school in the north of Spain where I basically was a prep cook in exchange for room and board. Basically, just I just got to exist there for long enough. How long were you there? Only like four or five months. Okay. And then you came back. Is that when you started working with, like with Danny Meyer. and Union Square yeah. Hospitality? At the time, did you think you come back and you're like, I hit the jackpot. I'm with USHG? For sure. There was no company I wanted to work for outside of USHG. Danny's partner, Richard Corain, came to one of my classes at Cornell called Organizational Behavior. And the moment that class was over, I started aggressively pursuing a relationship with him. I'm sure I was like that annoying kid from Cornell that was like, Mr. Corain, Mr. Corain, like, I'm really good. You got to hire me. And thank God he did. I knew I was going to work at USHG even before I went to Spain. It was just kind of set up that I was going there first and then I'd come back. 
to, to join the team at Tabla, which was Floyd Cardoza's restaurant within the group. Got it. So you came back, you joined Tabla. How long were you Tabla? I was there for about two years. Man, I love that place. And then you moved within the company, yeah? No. So after two years at Tabla, I was offered the job of assistant general manager at Blue Smoke Jazz Standard, which was, my gosh, my dream come true. I got to continue working for Danny in a restaurant that was a little bit more casual. And I was Kenny always Callahan? Drawn to, yeah, Kenny Callahan. So Kenny Callahan, barbecue. I always preferred more casual than more fancy in terms of where I wanted to work. And there was a musical component, but my dad made me not take it. At that point in my career, still today, but he's always been a very important resource for me. And when he has a very like fundamental belief on something, I'm inclined to follow his lead. And his perspective, at the time, Danny had four restaurants 11 Madison Tabla, Gramercy and Union Square, four of the best restaurants in the country. He kind of categorized restaurant companies as restaurant smart or corporate smart. His whole philosophy was that at a restaurant smart company, you're going to get an extraordinary education in service and leadership and creativity and empowerment. But what you don't have, because they're not big enough to have like a serious back office infrastructure, you never learn the systems that go into purchasing or accounting or human resources. And he wanted me to one day be able to have a company that was both restaurant smart and corporate smart. So I left Danny's company to go to work for Restaurant Associates. He wasn't there at this point. He had moved to work with Wolfgang Puck, but where I was a purchaser for three of the restaurants in the mornings and an accountant for those same three restaurants in the afternoons. So I went from working the front door at one of the coolest restaurants in New York to going to work at 5.30 in the morning for the least sexy restaurant job ever. But it was like business school and boot camp all wrapped up into one. Did your dad want you to stay on, on the restaurant associates path? Because as you probably know, it's a more normal lifestyle, if you will, than like the restaurant world. Is that what he was like urging you there? Or did he really want you to just get the experience and you knew you were going back into restaurants? I didn't know I was going to go back to Danny when I went to restaurant associates, nor was he trying to get me to pursue a career with restaurant associates. His thing was always like, hey, when you're young, build your foundation. It wasn't even as much see what else is out there. He just wanted me to have all of the tools in my toolbox so that I could decide whatever I wanted to do, I would be well equipped to go succeed at doing it. Got it. You went back to Danny from Restaurant Associates? Yeah, so I was there for probably two years. And then I went back and opened the restaurants at the Museum of Modern Art. Not the modern, but every other element of that operation. So I was the general manager of Cafe 2 and Terrace 5 and the staff cafeteria and the in-house catering and and I loved that. I loved that job. It was it so cool. We reached out to Danny Meyer and he said, why don't you ask Will about how he weighed and grappled with his decision to become the general manager of 11 Madison Park in the first place? He had a very different career path in mind at the time, and it took a lot of selling and convincing. <laughs> oh, man. I love that you're... <laughs> I love that you're managing some of the coolest places or hottest restaurants in New York and you wanted to run Shake Shack, if I remember that correctly. <laughs> what the hell were you thinking? I never wanted to be in fine dining. I like I had a complete aversion to the idea of fine dining because the restaurant business changed from when I was 12 to when I was 25. Restaurants for a long time, were about like what was happening in the dining room. You went there to see and be seen, to be taken care of, to feel a connection to the maitre d' and the people around you. And by the way, this isn't a bad thing. Generally, it just didn't feel right for me. It became, you know, with the advent of the celebrity chef and all of this stuff, it became so much about the chef and so little about the hospitality that I had an aversion to it. I believe that hospitality is taking what you do seriously without taking yourself too seriously. I believe that you can only be your most fully realized self at the table if you have fun at work and the stuffiness of those places made me allergic to them. It didn't feel like you could ever have fun working there or dining there and therefore I wanted nothing to do with them. And Shake Shack felt like, wait a minute, hold on, this is the most casual thing but done with precision and a focus on excellence and filled with integrity and it's Danny Meyer and it's casual and there's no chef at all and it can just be like 
this beautiful expression of giving people something delicious and helping to brighten their day. That, for me, felt amazing. And then Danny came and offered... And by the way, the reason I was in charge of the cafes at MoMA was because when I met with him after I'd been at Restaurant Associates for a couple of years, I said, I'm ready to be a general manager. I want nothing to do with fine dining. Do you have anything for me? And he had the cafes at MoMA. And so it was a perfect match. Then he came and said, what about 11 Madison Park? And I was like, yeah, what was the sales pitch here? (laughs) I was like, dude, I don't want like, (laughs) you're trying to make this into the most fine dining place. But I called my dad, as I always do told him what had happened. And he said, hey, listen, do you want to grow with that company? And I did. And he said, when they need you to be there for them, you should be if you ever expect them to be there for you. And I understood why Danny was offering me the job. It was the restaurant that was like pushing so hard towards excellence. And he was concerned that if it pushed too hard towards excellence without pushing just as hard towards hospitality, it wouldn't feel like a Danny Meyer restaurant anymore. And so I was almost the counterweight. And so the deal we made was that I'd go to 11 Madison for one year. And at the end of that year, I'd get to go work at Shake Shack, which now sounds hilarious, right? Like, I, I'll do it. I'll go to 11 Madison for a year as long as I get to work at Shake Shack. During the first year as GM of EMP, did you ever question that decision? I'm sure there must have been moments when I did. It was not easy at all. It was a lot of any time you're turning something around. And that's what that was, right? 11 Madison Park was one type of restaurant. It was being turned in a very different direction to become a different one with different groups of people within the restaurant that had competing interests. And it was effectively like oil and vinegar culturally with the fine dining crew that came in with Daniel and the people that had been at the restaurant for years because they were just a completely different set of priorities and core values. But so, yeah, well, I'm sure there were a few days where I went home and I was like, man, this is ridiculous. In general, no. I very quickly, you know, I never liked fine dining because I had never had the authority to change how it could feel until I was there. I was running the show. And suddenly I was like quickly realizing that fine dining is what that experience at the Four Seasons was. It's this moment. It's, a, it's an opportunity to create a magical world in a world that needs more magic. And now I had the authority to do it in a different way, just where it wasn't as much about like showing off. It wasn't as much about look what we can do. It wasn't about making the people walking into the restaurant feel lucky that they were there. It was just about creating a freaking cool restaurant where we were really good at what we did And we could have a lot of fun with the people we were serving. And the moment I realized that fine dining didn't have to be the thing I perceived it to be was the moment I realized that there was nothing else I wanted to do. So we have a lot of young listeners of the podcast, people going into college, in college, et cetera, and beyond. But you're an optimistic person, I feel. How do you handle challenges in your career in general? So my dad has a lot of things that he's said that I quote frequently. Perhaps the one I quote the most frequently is adversity is a terrible thing to waste. Challenges or adversity are inevitable. They will come sure as the fact that the sun will rise in the morning. You will face challenges and adversity for the rest of your life. You can't control that. What you can do is decide how you react to it. And I'm not like such a sunny optimist that I like to encourage people to just brush off challenges. I think it's essential when something shitty happens that you give yourself the grace and the space to feel bad about it, to to feel the weight of the disappointment, or even to feel bad for yourself. I don't think that's a bad thing. In fact, I think it's essential to process whatever grief comes from the challenge and then put it behind you and realize what you can either learn from the situation, how you can use it, to make you stronger, whether that's through like learning something from it or honestly allowing the challenge to like kind of make you angry so you push even harder, right? It can be education, it can be motivation. So how do I respond to challenges? I feel bad for myself for a minute and then I use it to to propel me further. Okay, so after five years at EMP in 2011, you and your business partner at the time Chef Daniel Hum purchased 11 Madison Park from Union Square Hospitality Group at Danny Meyer. Take us back to the day when you met with Danny. Like, how does that conversation go? (laughs) 
Because I remember like reading about it and I was like, holy shit, who does that? You know what I mean? I knew you were on to something, but I'm curious. It wasn't my idea. We had been approached to do the restaurant at the Nomad. I loved 11 Madison Park. I knew this is 2011. We weren't anywhere close to realizing the potential there of what we were building. I wanted to be a part of 11 Madison Park for a very, very, very long time, but I also didn't want to be an employee for the rest of my life. And we were given this opportunity at Nomad to be owners there. And so the conversation with Danny started with me saying, hey, I got an idea. We're going to start our own company where we own the Nomad separate from Union Square Hospitality Group, but we still run 11 Madison Park as a part of your team. How do you feel about that? And he's like, no. <laughs> and of course, it's Danny. So like, he was completely right. He normally is. That would have been it. That would never have worked. But I asked him the question. He said, let me think about it. About a week or two later, we met again. That's when he said no. But what he said right afterwards is, how about instead you buy 11 Madison Park? He recognized, I think, that we were the right people to run it. And it was going in a really, really good direction. And he also recognized that when you have in your gut a desire to be an entrepreneur, there was nothing that anyone could have done at that point to get us to abandon that ambition. And so us not doing Nomad and just being employees at 11 Madison, that would have had a short shelf life anyway. Interesting. What do you wish you would have known before purchasing 11 Madison Park? I am actually grateful for how little I knew. And let me explain that. I think too often people over-research everything that is entailed with doing the thing I'm raising my hand, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and by the way, because when you over-research it, when you over-analyze it, you can psych yourself out of doing it. Sometimes you just need to go with your gut. By the way, he said that, what if you guys buy the restaurant? And before two seconds had passed, I said, we'd love to. I didn't even check in with Daniel. I was like, yes, we would love to. I had no idea what was entailed. I had no idea how to set up a company. I had no idea how to raise money, ROIs, accounting, HR, any of it. And if I had spent too much time thinking about all the things I was going to need to figure out, I might have said something differently. The restaurant business is hard. There's so much about it that is really, really challenging. There's no reason to sugarcoat that, right? Whether it's lawsuits and labor and competition and landlords and everything. But the reason that I wanted to own restaurants will always be the thing that is most present in my relationship to restaurants generally. I love, love, love restaurants. I love managing a team. I love creating these little fantasy worlds and I love serving people. And that's the only thing I needed to know then because had I known more, it wouldn't have changed anything. It would have just psyched me out a little bit more. And so like, I'm grateful that I had the education I did. So I was able to navigate through that journey pretty effectively. But sometimes ignorance genuinely is something I can recommend. (laughs) Okay, so EMP goes on to get four stars from the New York Times, five stars from the Forbes Travel Guide, three Michelin stars, and the number one spot on the world's 50 best restaurants list amongst many others. I love the story in your book that when you first made it on the 50 best list at number 50, you and Daniel were kind of caught on camera sulking a little bit, like with your head in your hand, you were gutted. And then a few years later, you wind up getting the coveted number one spot. It's been held by as Obviously, you know, Noma and Massimo Batura, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Number 50 is no small feat. (laughs) <laughs> obviously let's get that straight and then you get to number one which is kind of insane i'm curious like what happens at emp between 50 and number one that's really kind of the journey in the book right like i don't believe it's a reasonable thing to say that one restaurant is the best restaurant in the world i think that's kind of like patently absurd i, I think what that list does is it acknowledges the restaurant that is having the greatest impact 
on the world of restaurants at any given time. You look at what El Bulli did with molecular gastronomy, and that brought them to the top of that list for years. Then you look at what Noma did with the world of like local and foraging, and that brought them to the top of that list. And the impact that those restaurants have had is far reaching, and you can feel it in restaurants across the world. You can feel it in like an Applebee's and in your grocery store, right? Like they, they've changed things. And when I looked at those restaurants, their impact was on what needed to change. They pushed the conversation forward with regards to what was being put on the plate. I felt like we had an opportunity to make our impact if we focused on the one thing that would never change, which is the human desire to be cared for. I saw chefs all over the world being celebrated for being unreasonable in what they were serving and the food that they were serving. And we decided to be unreasonable about how we served it, about how we made people feel about our hospitality. And that's what made us number one, is we brought a focus, like this unreasonable hospitality to that level of restaurant that I've now gone to other restaurants around the world and I've seen the impact that it's had. And I think that's the big thing. Like every restaurant, every customer service business in the world is constantly, whether they realize it or not, navigating the tension between hospitality and excellence. Those two envelopes, like, how do you make things as perfect as they can possibly be and also as warm and as gracious and as friendly as they can possibly be? They're not friends because you achieve those two outcomes differently. You can scare the shit out of everyone on your team to not make a mistake and they're not going to make many mistakes and the restaurant's going to be very, very excellent. But if everyone's so scared of not making a mistake, they're not bringing their most fully realized selves to the table. Similarly, you can just celebrate everyone on your team all the time and you don't care about standards and the restaurant's not not going to be excellent and it's going to be so friendly. Navigating the tension between those two is hard and I think why we were finally able to figure out how to navigate it so effectively is we decided that maintaining balance between hospitality and excellence didn't mean that we needed to be more reasonable in our pursuit of excellence. It meant we needed to be more unreasonable in our pursuit of hospitality and I think that's what brought us to the top. So you hit number one, like what's the North Star from there? Well, then we just closed the restaurant and gutted it and did a complete renovation of it, which my dad was so mad at me when we did that. He's like, are you kidding me? Like you have wait lists that are 3,000 people long. We're like, all right, now's a good time to close for three months and spend all our money. Getting to number one felt like the end of one chapter and the beginning of the next. And I wanted a restaurant that felt like it was genuinely mine and not like the restaurant I'd inherited from Danny and also wanted to recreate it such that the physical restaurant was more perfectly tailored for the restaurant concept that we were running inside of it. Got it. You say in the book, you like to be in control. Are you a controlling person? That is the thing I struggle with most in my career is on one hand, I love creating collaborative environments. I love empowering the team, trusting them to do what they think is right. I recognize that the guest experience and the employee experience are always going to be that much better if everyone on the team is not just executing someone else's vision, but if they truly have a hand in creating it from a macro perspective and also in the moment every single day and every night. I do have OCD tendencies. And I do have a very specific belief on what right looks like and how exactly something should be done. Have you learned to let go? Yes, but it requires being intentional. It's a fine line to walk and invariably I fall off the line from time to time in one or the other direction. And when I do, I find myself overreacting by going too far in the other way. And it's just something I've learned about myself. I think there's certain things where you can learn and you don't need to relearn them over and over and over again. That is the one thing that I know myself well enough to know I'll probably have to stay focused on for the rest of my career. What three words would you use to describe yourself? I think I'm optimistic. I am like, I just believe in people. I believe that if you put good stuff into the world, good stuff will come back to you. I genuinely believe when I say adversity is a terrible thing to waste, that there's always an opportunity for improvement. I really believe that. I'm not just saying that. Optimism, optimistic. That's one. I'm ambitious. 
I am. One of the things my dad gave me when I was a kid, it was a paperweight that said, what would you attempt to do if you knew you could not fail? He always wanted me to answer that question honestly. Whatever the answer was, to do everything I could to try to achieve that, no matter how unrealistic it seemed at the time. So ambitious. And <laughs> I guess for the third, we could decide between neurotic and loyal. <laughs> One of the two. <laughs> That's funny. Would your wife agree on these things? I think my wife would agree. Did you call her too before this? No, I didn't. <laughs> Maybe. No, I didn't. What three words would she use to describe you? I hope the same ones. I love how you snuck the fourth in there. No, it's one, two, and three A and three B. <laughs> how is Will Goddard the like GM restaurant owner hospitality extraordinaire verse? Will Gadara, the husband, father. You know, I've had to learn, and this is going to sound like a joke. I, I, I'm actually saying it sincerely. I believe one of the most important parts of creating a strong culture at work is your approach to feedback. I think like normalizing feedback within an environment is everything, right? Constantly giving feedback, affirmation, constructive criticism, and normalizing it such that when you criticize someone, it's not an attack. People don't get defensive. They actually understand you're just investing in them and trying to make it better. And in those conversations, like if I am in a relationship at work where someone on the team has done something that made me feel a certain way and I feel like it needs to be addressed, Normalizing feedback means in a very unemotional way, I sit down and say, hey, bud, you did this. This is how it made me feel. That wasn't great. Or what you just did with the guest, that doesn't work here. You can't do that. And then when the conversation's over, it's over. You move on in life. And I think I'm pretty good at it. Like that is one of the things that's made me a great leader is being very focused and intentional in embracing tension between people and recognizing that your approach to affirmation and investing in people is one of the most important things you can do every single day. I've had to learn that in marriage, you cannot treat relationships like you do at work. I think that there's so much crossover. A relationship is, at the end of the day, a relationship. For those listening, that was said with a sparkly smile, <laughs> um, just so you know. And I think the other thing that it takes time to, and listen, my wife is... A, the CEO of a massive company. I ran a pretty damn big company myself. And being married to people who have always been used to being in charge, that's made me a better person. I've become more patient. I've become more understanding. I've recognized that there isn't always just one right way to do something. In fact, sometimes my opinion is actually just an opinion. It's not a rule. <laughs> so while I did not reach out to Christina. I did reach out to some other people and I told them I was going to speak with you. Do you want to hear what they had to say? Uh, yeah, I would love that. Here we go. Let's start with Rene Redzepi. Oh. He said, the first thing that comes to mind is Will's positive mindset. I would even say annoyingly positive mindset. <laughs> For me, it comes from a place of light jealousy, but I can always see how busy he is with responsibilities all over the place yet he always attacks issues with absolute positivity. It's inspirational. How do you remain positive? That's me asking. Thanks, Renee. That's very kind. I don't know, man. You know, that's a hard thing to be instructive around. I guess I've just never understood why one would choose the alternative. And I think one of the best ways to remain positive is actually to just sit down and consider for a moment all the reasons why it's better than choosing to be negative. And to remember, like, too many people, like, operate as if they don't have control over it. And I'm not saying it's easy, but it is a choice. And I found it much more energizing to choose to be positive than to just let yourself fall into being negative. Yeah, so good. Up next is... Chef Grant Ackett's from Alinea and others in Chicago. He says, Will exudes charisma that is simultaneously boyish and king-like. The toothy smile and sparkling eyes coupled with the finesse and confidence of a statesman immediately disarms and sets you at ease. That is hospitality. Chef Ackett's describes hospitality as you. How do you define hospitality in one sentence? Hospitality is about, hospitality is giving people a sense of belonging, it's making people feel seen, and it's making people feel welcome. Love it. Okay, just one more. Thanks, Grant, that was very sweet. 
Chef Danielle Balut. He shared the same story from your book about the memorable late night party at your house during your Cornell years. <laughs> So I urge people maybe just to get the book for that story. No, I'm just kidding. There's more in there. <laughs> Details in unreasonable hospitality. Chef Balud also says, Will came to New York and in a short time distinguished himself in the Danny Meyer world. What always strike me back then is how much Will wanted to learn and gain confidence with himself to be the best host in America. He evolved with service and new management style to fit his generation of staff and customers, but deep inside, he was very respectful about the past generation and New York restaurant history. What one lesson did you learn from Danielle Ballou? Danielle is simultaneously one of the most successful and famous chefs in the world and one of the kindest and most supportive chefs to anyone that has passion for restaurants. He has never become egotistical. He's never let any of it go to his head. And he's never, not even once, allowed his success to compromise his generosity. And I've seen that happen to so many other people who experience some success and then honestly turn into a dick, right? Daniel Balud is, as far as that goes, I don't think there's anyone better. And you pick your role models and you can have a bunch of different role models if you focus on what is the thing about them that you want to spend your life trying to emulate. And I hope that no matter how much or how little success I find in life that I am as warm and generous to others as he has been to so many. Yeah, he's amazing. Last, did we touch upon this at the beginning? The last overall restaurant or hospitality experience in general that stopped you in your tracks. You had mentioned an airplane, you had good service, didn't you? Yeah, the one I wanna share is I was at Nomad in London when I was speaking at the 50 Best Awards. And this is a, it was kind of an emotional experience for me. I designed that restaurant and that hotel and then sold the company before it was built. And so I was walking into a restaurant that was kind of mine, but also not mine, filled with a lot of people that used to work for me for a long time. And I wasn't sure when I was going there how it would feel and whether it would feel like good or, or bad, honestly. And Leo Robachek, who worked with me for a long time, and again, Chris Perone and a woman named Krista Millar and the entire team, they went so above and beyond to make me feel like I was in my home the entire time I was there, whether it was reserving the chair in the library that felt the same as the chair in the library that was mine in New York, or having all the things I love in my room, or asking me to do pre-meal in the dining room, or so many other things. I think at its best, hospitality can tap into some of the most beautiful and personal parts of you. And they, it was a master class. That's very cool. Thanks for sharing that story. I saw that post also on your Instagram, if anyone wants greater detail and photos. In 2014, you started or co-founded, I'll say, the Welcome Conference, which recently made its return just last month. You initially started it for restaurant, hotel, service, hospitality industry in general, I guess I'll say. Correct me if I'm wrong. But in the book, you said you looked out into the crowd, you saw people from different industries who attended and thought, maybe they too have something to learn from our industry. Was there a moment you learned something from hospitality, speaking from a visit to a bank, a car wash somewhere that someone wouldn't necessarily put under the, what they think is the hospitality umbrella, but what you know is a way larger umbrella? For sure. What I, I tell this story in the book, but actually no, I'll, I'll tell one that I didn't tell in the book. I think you can be inspired everywhere all around you, as long as you keep your eyes open and are paying attention, right? Like I went to see Rocky the Musical, which didn't have a long shelf life on Broadway, but a friend of mine got us tickets and me and my wife and two of our friends went. And at the end of the show, they wanted to like create the big fight, right? And when you go to a boxing ring, there's people sitting all around the ring. Whereas when you go to a show, everyone's sitting kind of in front of the stage, right? So it's a very different dynamic. And so what they did was suddenly like towards the end of the show, these guys came and got everyone sitting in the front 30 middle rows of the theater to get up and line up in the aisles. And then they took these giant metal posts and screwed them into the ground. Then they went back on stage and pushed the stage that was on wheels 
out so it was like now over those seats being supported by those poles. Then they set up chairs on the stage and then they brought everyone that was waiting in the aisles up onto the stage and now there was a boxing ring in the middle of the room. This is what I loved about that. I imagined the meeting where someone was like, I got an idea and described what I just said. And it was a meeting where for whatever reason, everyone else in the room didn't say like, Joe, that's freaking ridiculous. Stop it. We're not doing that. Right. They were so focused on the feeling that they wanted everyone to have that they decided they were going to do whatever it took to bring that feeling to life. And so I think there's stuff like that all around you. And honestly, I think one of the best ways to change the game within your industry is to find inspiration from other industries. Yeah. 100%. The book, which we've obviously hit upon. I love that this book is published under Simon Sinek's imprint, Optimism Press. For those who don't know who he is, well, you should. He's an author, extremely inspirational speaker. He has one of the most views TED Talks with like, I don't know, 60 million, probably more views. But this Optimism Press fits quite nicely with you, like in your brand. Can you be honest? Do you ever see the glass as half empty? You asked me, like, how am I positive? And I say, because I choose to be. And then when we talked about adversity, I said, sometimes you need to give yourself the grace and the space to process through disappointment. There's definitely moments when I feel bad for myself. I feel like the glass is half empty. I feel like nothing's going my way. Blah, 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 blah. And once I've allowed myself to feel those feelings for long enough, I say, okay, bro, let's get back up. There's a lot of reasons to feel pretty good. And by the way, I don't know of many people that if they don't give themselves long enough to think about it, can't find a lot of reasons to feel pretty blessed by a lot of things. Sometimes you just need to look a little bit harder to find them. I read the Wall Street Journal piece this morning and I called our main producer and he's a good friend and said, oh man, there's also this and here's the headline and here's some other things in there that, you know, how he wrote. And he's like, Jesus, what the fuck? He's like, I'm 47 and I feel like I've done nothing with my life. Look at all this (laughs) stuff that he's done. (laughs) Meanwhile, he's extremely talented in his own regard. He's a television (laughs) producer and helps me on the side here. Okay, so it was last week. I was listening to a podcast. It was Malcolm Gladwell interviewing Adam Grant. They were talking about one of Adam's books. It's probably an old episode. And I was thinking, oh, should I get this book? Do I need another fucking book to pile up like on my desk for our listeners wondering if they should buy unreasonable hospitality how would you sell it brag away will brag away <laughs> i thought you were about to tell everyone why they should buy it but you know what fine i, I guess i'll I, do that i, I will <laughs> <laughs> they want to hear you not me i, I wrote this book years yeah. after someone first told me they thought i should write a book because It wasn't until I finally decided to do it that I was confident I had enough to share that I'd be proud of, of what I ended up with. This book is, it's filled with every lesson I've ever learned about service and leadership approached through the lens of hospitality. I believe that being a great leader is one of the most evergreen skills you can learn. No matter what restaurant you work at, you're going to learn different steps of service. You're going to learn about a different menu. You're going to learn different wines, all that stuff. But if you recognize that no matter what position you are in within the hierarchy of an organization, that does not prevent you from deciding that you are going to be a leader within that organization. You need to recognize that. But then you also need to realize that leadership is as much of a craft as cooking is or as services. And hospitality is as much of a craft as cooking is or as services. And I've taken everything I've learned, whether it's from the amazing mentors I've had or from the experiences that I've been lucky to have and put them in this book. But it's a book called Unreasonable Hospitality. And so I wanted to be hospitable and make sure it wasn't like a boring leadership book. And so it's told through the narrative of making 11 Madison Park the number one restaurant in the world. And so I'd I'd like to think it's a pretty fun read. And I think people that decide to read it will learn at least a few things that could really benefit how they approach their work and honestly, their life as well. Absolutely. Thank you. I've recommended it to quite a few people. And to be honest, many of them aren't even in the restaurant hotel industry because you could be an ad agency, a PR firm, a dry cleaner. Hospitality is everywhere. How you make someone feel, how you treat people. I mean, there's a lot there. 
to unpack. And I think there's a lot of people like you did with the Welcome Conference that are going to read this outside our industry and benefit from it for their industry. Okay, so Beyond the Plate likes to celebrate social impact with every guest and what they do to give back to the community. And many of our guests do it in different ways. And working in a restaurant, it's hard to avoid it. We serve people, we give away gift certificates, auction dinners, support causes, support team members doing a run, whatever it may be, 100 other examples. I know I'm familiar with a couple of the different causes and organizations over the years, and I guess I'm going to jump into a couple and feel free to tack on any more. Even Daniel Belude, when he replied, mentioned to me the importance of mentorship for you as it pertains to your staff. And that's giving back right there, right? Is that a priority for you? Or how do you see that? I've been lucky that when I've reached out to the Daniel Baloods or the Danny Myers or the My Dads, they've always been there generous enough to give me their time. And I know how meaningful that was to me. I think it's pretty amazing how 30 minutes of your time can be so unbelievably impactful for another person. And yeah, that is a priority to me to always try to find time to do that for others. Not that I can always do it for everyone, but to try my best. And then you were instrumental in IRC, the Independent Restaurant Coalition, which was formed during the pandemic, which accomplished a great deal. Like two and a half years into this, can you share like what more needs to be done? For the restaurant industry, it's probably a lot, but anything we want to touch on there? It's interesting. It's like what more needs to be done for the restaurant industry and what more needs to be done by the restaurant industry. And I mean, those are two very different questions, but they both kind of get to the same place. Here's the reality with restaurants. We were, our industry was like one of the most hard hit during COVID, not just because mostly need to be in person to, to be out at a restaurant, but because the business model was the most precarious going into it, right? No restaurant is just sitting on buckets of cash to weather a storm because the margins are slim enough. That's just not the reality. And by the way, there are plenty of good restaurant businesses, right? But if you're kind of using an average here. And yet at the same time, then during COVID, I think there's no denying that restaurants need to pay people more and create better quality of life and So now we're looking at this impossible combination of restaurants aren't making enough money and their expenses need to actually be higher. That is kind of by the industry and for the industry, right? Like there are things that I think can be done from a legislative perspective, right? I do think there should be payroll tax credits. Like you look at how much labor taxes, for example, at a restaurant versus like a branch of a Chase bank, right? Where we're both occupying the same number of square feet and we're employing 50 times more people than they are. There should be incentive to employ a lot of people such that restaurants have the ability to then pour that money back into the same people that they're employing. I think there's got to be something that's figured out with like rent and escalating rent and the relationship between landlords and restaurants. And that's either something that's done for the restaurant or by the restaurant by just like people recognizing that things need to be done differently and everyone's starting to behave in such a way where the landlords don't have as much power as they've had for a long time. I think guests need to understand that like, you can't be a bleeding heart liberal and want everyone to make a lot more money and then get really upset when someone charges a little bit more for a plate of food because they compare how much the cost of a chicken dish at a restaurant is relative to buying a chicken breast at their local grocery store, right? Like, I think restaurants are places you need to be empathetic to give great hospitality. Restaurants pour empathy into the world, at least the great ones do. And I think the more that empathy becomes a two-way exchange, the better off the model will become. Yeah, like a quick speed round, not giving you time to think. What did you have for dinner last night? Dinner last night, I was actually at a cocktail party at the new Teresi, and I didn't actually have dinner, but I had a bunch of cacio e pepe arancini. Last time you ate fast food, and what? Last time I ate fast food was about a week ago in the car on my way from New York to Philadelphia, and it was a bacon double cheeseburger at Burger King. What about hospitality still makes you smile? 
There's nothing that makes me smile more than when I see the look of complete joy on someone's face when they receive a gift I'm responsible for giving them. What pisses you off about hospitality that people can't seem to get and they should? That it feels better to be nice than it does to not be nice. So just stop being a dick and start being nice. <laughs> <laughs> what actor is playing Will Goddard in a movie? I don't know, somewhere between like Adam Sandler and Nicolas Cage. <laughs> I like it. I like it. <laughs> All right. In closing here, Rene Redzepi shared some more words with us about you. He called you an innovator. He said, in the service industry where things have stagnated for so long to the point where the industry has been suffocating itself from within, you came with fresh ideas, new perspectives, and conversation. He said the world needs hundreds of wills scattered all over the world innovating in the field of service. Let that seep in. What advice do you have for the hundreds or thousands of young wills out there that are the future of hospitality? I guess I would just go back to the, the plaque my dad gave me. What would you attempt to do if you knew you could not fail? Too many people are scared to answer that question honestly for fear that if they do and they don't actually achieve it, they're letting themselves and those around them down. But if you do have the confidence and conviction to say out loud what your honest answer is, you have a real chance of achieving it. And by the way, like thinking big with audaciousness and ambition as it pertains to making other people feel good, I think that there's nobility in service because we have the capacity to make the world a nicer place just by being really, really nice to everyone that walks through our doors. And I can't wait to see what all hundreds of you go out there and accomplish. Thousands. Let's make it thousands. Thousands. Thank you for your time. I appreciate you. I'm excited for people to read this book. It's beautiful. It's inspiring. It's powerful. And I truly believe it's going to make a difference. So thank you for being a champion of hospitality and for hospitality. And thank you so much for having me. This was awesome. And I appreciate you too. How was my technique? It was like a warm bath on a cold day. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. I appreciate it. Thanks, man. You're the man. This is a blast. I'll All see right. you soon, brother. Take care. Thanks again to Will Gadara. Find him on Instagram at W Gadara. That's W G U I D A R A. To learn more about the IRC, the Independent Restaurant Coalition, go to independentrestaurantcoalition.com. We'll share a link to those websites in the episode notes and at beyondtheplatepodcast.com. Find me and keep up to date with this podcast across all social media at On Cappy's Plate or go to beyondtheplatepodcast.com. Beyond the Plate is on all the socials at BT Plate Podcast. This episode was produced by myself along with Ian Cohen, Joel Yetten, and Sean Petrosian. Our digital media producer is Sarah McClellan Me. Our music has been composed by Goldford. Find him at iGoldford. And as always, a special shout out to my wife, Katie. If you do have a moment, we'd love and appreciate it if you could rate or review and subscribe to this podcast on your listening site of choice. Don't forget to join us next Wednesday for an episode of Beyond the Drink, our companion podcast of Beyond the Plate, brought to you by our friends at Ford's Gym. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Plate. I'm Cappy. And remember, there are never too many cooks in the kitchen.